So um, welcome everyone to this evening's session um, of the Crossroads webinar series. I think this is our, our third episode that we um, are hosting. Um, the theory behind these webinar um, series episodes is to share information with you uh, and knowledge that you can share in your own classrooms with your children, um, whether you work in a mainstream environment or a remedial environment or even a special needs environment. I think it's a good reminder for us of um, the skills we need and the awareness uh, of, of uh, certain skills um, and areas of, of development um, that need to be, be focused on. Um, this evening's webinar is recorded. Uh, it will be sent to all registered participants. I need to make you aware that we've had over 115 um, membership registrations uh, in, in the last few days. So this recording will be sent out to all of those um, registered members. Um, the majority are educators. We do have some interested um, parents who are attending as well. Um, my name is not Velwit. My name is Tessa Turley, um, and I am the marketing manager at Crossroads School. I would like to introduce Georgina Dempster, who is our educational psychologist and who will be speaking to us this evening on working memory and um, on the CogMed program. Um, as, a, as a housekeeping um, element, we uh, please will you keep your videos off and your mute buttons on um, for the duration of the, uh, of the webinar. And please, will you save all your answers until the end? We will have a question and answer session. And um, if you would like to, to post questions in, in the chat as we go along, you're welcome to, to do so, but they will only be answered at the end. So that's it from me. Georgina, would you like to, to start? Um, we do keep the, the, the speaking to strictly an hour because this is only meant to cost an hour of your time, which is probably our, your most valuable um, thing you have to contribute to, to the session. So um, we will be ending at, at 6.30 on, on the dot and uh, we hope you enjoy tonight's session. So Georgina, take it away, please. Okay. Thank you, Tessa, and, and welcome to everyone that's attending. Um, it's very nerve wracking that there's so many attending, but obviously um, it's an indication that uh, there is a definite need to chat about working memory. Um, and the consequence of uh, a poor working memory. So as we have spoken, the tonight's uh, slideshow is all about, or webinar, sorry, if I can get it to go, is all about your working memory and the CogMed program that we have um, implemented in Crossroads School. So before I can talk about the CogMed program, it's important for me to to chat to you a little bit about working memory and the theory behind our CogMed program and why um, working memory is so important and vital in, in our children. So what is working memory? Now there's a lot of confusion because there's a difference between your working memory, your short-term memory um, and your long-term memory. So your working memory is the ability to keep the information in your mind for short periods. So literally seconds. And then the, the, to use that information. So the clue is in the word working memory. So it is your use of what you've taken in and, and your ability to use it. And it's a very big indicator of academic success. So in order to, to give you a better idea or better understanding of what working memory is, I'm going to show you a very short clip that's going to explain it and then I'll, I'll discuss it in further detail. How Does Human Memory Work? by Academy of Learning Career College. This model provides a helpful framework for thinking about how memory works. Memory can be thought of as having three critical components. Sensory memory. Sensory memory takes information from the environment through the human senses, sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. Sensory memory can take a lot of information, but information is stored for only a very short time, with visual information being stored for less than half a second 
and auditory information being stored for only 3 to 4 seconds. Working memory. Working memory is what you are conscious of or what you are thinking about at any given moment. This is where the memory work happens. People can only handle a small amount of information in their working memory at one time. We cannot think about a million things at once. In fact, we can only hold about four things in our working memory at a time. We also cannot hold that information for very long. Working memory duration is about 5 to 20 seconds unless we actively try to remember information by repeating it. Long-term memory Long-term memory is where we hold all our memories. One goal of learning is to get information into long-term memory so we can use it later when we need it. We have a lot of room to store memories, but the memories we store are not perfect representations of the outside world. Long-term memory is relatively permanent. However, if we want to maintain easy access to a memory, we need to retrieve that information regularly. What this means is that learning depends on three critical processes. Attention, encoding, and retrieval. Attention. To get new information into long-term memory, it must go through the working memory, and to get into working memory, we must pay attention to it. This means that attention and focus are the starting point for learning. If learners are not paying attention to course materials, they will not be able to process the information or remember it later. Distractions, text messages, notifications, daydreaming, are not helpful for learning. Encoding. Once we are conscious of information in our working memories, we want to encode the information into long-term memory. Encoding is made easier when learners connect new information to what they already know. Information and processes are repeated. Information is assembled, structured, and organized. It can help to think of your memory a little bit like a filing cabinet. It is easier to find things when they are filed away in an organized fashion. Information is translated from however it is originally seen and heard into something created by the learner. Retrieval Taking information out of long-term memory and into our conscious working memory so we can change our behavior. Retrieval gets easier when you practice. The more you retrieve something from long-term memory, the easier it becomes. People who have been tested on material are more likely to remember it later and apply it than people who only studied the material. Okay. So oftentimes when, um, as a psychologist, we, we sort of see children with working memory difficulties, um, parents will say, but my child can remember things, you know, from long ago, or he, um, he can remember facts and, and that. And there's a, a misunderstanding of the difference between a working memory and, and a long-term memory. So in your sensory memory, as they said, is everything you take in with your senses. Your short-term memory is things that you keep for a brief amount of time. So working memory and short-term memory do overlap, but the difference is in working memory, you've got to take that and use it straight away. So um, in the video, they said you've got to take it and use strategies um, so that you can use it later. So if you take, for example, um, learning um, a phone number, okay, no, now we don't because we can just punch it into our um, phones. But in the past, you had to remember a, a set of numbers. So a working memory strategy would be to repeat it to yourself um, or write it down. Um, same with directions. If you ask somebody for directions, your working memory is you listen to those instructions. And if you need to remember it, you're going to write it down. So you're acti actively going to do something with the information. And what's very important is it's linked to the long-term memory. So what we take in 
has to go to the long-term memory and then we have to take it back from the long-term memory into the working memory. Another important thing that came out of that video was attention is the starting point of learning. How many times do we notice children that cannot focus? Um, working memory is a good indicator of, you know, of um, is a child able to, to focus? So that distraction or that distractibility is a sign. Mm, it's not the only sign that there's perhaps something, you know, th that there is an issue with the working memory, but it's a good indicator that perhaps they, they are not able to focus. So as I've said to you, the importance of working memory is um, firstly controlling that attention. So we've said learning starts with attention. So paying attention, understanding what the teacher wants from you. Um, reading comprehension. Oftentimes we find children will read something and they read beautifully, it's fluent. But if you ask them, what did you read? They can't remember. And it's that kind of retrieval. So it, it, the working memory is being able to read something and actually take it in and, and be able to answer questions about it. Um, mathematical reasoning, uh, as you get into to high school, remembering those formulas or um, the different um, things that you have even in science as well to put together in order to answer some. How do I do this? Bod mass, you know, what are the, the, the steps that I need to follow? Um, working memory helps with just being organized, planning yourself, um, keeping instructions in mind. So when the teacher says, I want you to do this and this and this, can I maintain that focus? Can I follow through? Um, resisting the distraction. Um, am I able to resist what the, the teacher is saying and continue, um, you know, or, or could, you know, listen to what the teacher is saying and not be distracted by the child's talking next to me or something happening outside. Okay, so I just want to show another little clip on why working memory is so important um, in our learners um, and the impact that it can have on learning in, in the school environment. Sorry, I'm just going to start the video. Working memory is the ability to um, take in and then also manipulate information simultaneously. So a typical task that's used to assess for working memory might be when children are read a series of numbers and then asked to repeat those numbers in a backward order. And that's testing this cognitive process that they're able to take in information, manipulate it in some kind of way. So we are finding that deficits in working me memory as well as other types of executive functions increase the risk for repeated academic difficulties. And that seems to occur across a range of different academic domains, reading, mathematics, and science. In our final analyses, the odds ratios for those children who um, are displaying deficits in executive functions, particularly in working memory, um, they're about three to five times as likely to experience repeatedly low academic achievement across time as children without those deficits. I would start with um, children who seem to be repeatedly struggling academically, and we've ruled out possible reasons for those academic struggles, but that instead the child is repeatedly across several grade levels displaying continuing academic difficulties. The Department of Ed Education is still collecting data on this sample, and so we're planning to continue analyzing the interplay between executive functions and academic achievement across time as the cohort of children continue um, to the upper elementary grades, fourth and fifth grade. So what's important there is as psychologists, um, how do you determine 
that a child has a poor working memory. So in, when we do our cognitive assessments, part of that cognitive assessment is to assess their working memory. So there's two types of working memory. There's their auditory and there's their visual spatial. And just as I said in the video, um, auditory is a, a, a list of numbers that they have to give back. Um, so when we assess that we give them the numbers forward, they have to give it back to us, we give it to them forward and they have to give it to us backwards. We give it in um, sequence where they have to sequence numbers. We also give them letters and numbers that they need to sequence. So all the time, um, they are taking in the information on an auditory level and they have to sort it in their mind in order to give it back to us. On the visual spatial memory, um, they are looking at pictures and they have to uh, remember the sequence of pictures in the order that they saw them. So when we, when we assess, we can see um, the, the, if there's a deficit. So we look at the scores. Um, and then we would say, okay, this child has poor working memory. But oftentimes there's not an assessment and you're going to um, be working with these children in class and you're going to notice things. So what are you going to notice as an educator, as a parent in the class? So some of the things that you might notice is just that struggle of being able to maintain attention, um, whether they are internally or externally distracted, um, there is an element of distraction or whether it's the child that's fiddling with the pencils on their, their desk or um, constantly um, talking to the other friend or any little noise distracts them. Um, they're also children that when you give a task, they might be the ones that sit there and they um, almost wait because they're not sure how to start, where to start. Um, and oftentimes there are children that maybe start, but uh, never finish. They, they need that constant prompting. Okay, you need to carry on because they are distracted because that other things are happening. Um, there are children that um, struggle to remember instructions. So you, um, if you think of a working memory as, a, as an educator, you might say to the children, right, I want everybody to take out their books and I want you to write today's date and then wait for the next instruction. Your child with working memory is scratching in their bag and then they think, what am I looking for? Oh, oh, I need my book. Which book was it that she asked me? And, and that's what that, you know, because they've heard part of it, but they haven't been able to process. And they are the ones that are then the one you need to go to and say, have you got this book? I need you to write the date. Um, and these are also children that are very impulsive. Um, they constantly interrupt. Um, they can't wait for another person's turn because as they have a thought, they need to share it um, because it's not going to stay there. They need to get it out before um, they forget that thought. Uh, they have difficulties getting organized. You will see their desks are a mess. And as we've said, it's generalized. They'll have a learning difficulty. So it's in all the areas. Now, I know a lot of this sounds like, well, this is your typical ADHD child. So then everybody with ADHD must have a poor working memory. There is a huge correlation um, because uh, ADHD obviously relates to a child's ability to focus. So there is a correlation, but it's not to say that uh, you wouldn't have a child with poor working memory that maybe does not have ADHD. Look, the likelihood is, is most children with ADHD do have poor working memory, but it's not um, an overall that everybody will. So... The next question I always get asked as um, from parents and teachers, well, that's great. So now you've told me my child has a poor working memory. You've told me what difficulties or the teacher saying, yes, I see this. So what do I do about it? How, how, does, how do I help this child with poor working memory difficulty? So the, one of the strategies um, is to work with um, minimizing the load on the working memory um, and slowly building it to increase their capacity. 
So breaking down information. So not giving them that information overload. So just in terms of your instructions, um, firstly, you would say you would give one instruction. So take out your book. Then you would start to increase once, uh, your, and, and this is the same at home, you could say, go to the kitchen and go and fetch um, a cup of water. Um, you would then start to increase it. You, uh, it's um, but then giving two instructions. The other part of that is once you've given an instruction is to ask the child to give it back to you because that way you are getting them to use that information. So if you've said to them, take out your book and write the date. Okay, what did I ask you to do? Then they've got to tell you because then they are putting that memory or that in information into action. Um, so that is the way to, to build it. Um, reducing goals. So don't uh, give them, you, you need to do this and this and this and this today. Oftentimes, these children need um, a visual structure of the day. Or today we're going to do this, we're going to do maths, then we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do this. Even um, in terms of getting ready for school in the morning, what is our routine? for getting ready. I want you to first do this, then do this, then do this. Um, those charts work well. Um, for older children, it's having almost like rubrics. Uh, what needs to be done? What is the expectation of me um, so that I sort of get a good understanding of what the expectation is? So for children with poor working memory, they um, thrive in environments that are structured, that are consistent, um, that give them both the verbal and the visual clues, because we want to work on the auditory and the visual. Sometimes in assessing, we will find that uh, children have a poor um, auditory working memory, but a very strong visual memory. So I always then um, advise parents or to use their strength. So, Yes, we need to work on the auditory, but then use the strength of the visual in order to, to build the auditory um, and vice versa. Um, and that's also an indication of how they're going to learn. So often children um, develop their learning style in terms of the strength in their working memory. We are in an age where um, a lot of teaching and learning is on an auditory level, but there's so much visual that can be added with our, the children have access to YouTube videos, to all those things where they can combine the skills in order to work on that working memory. Um, those children need uh, compensationary thing, strategies like um, writing things down on the board or uh, actually you know in high school I know children are expected to write down their homework and that is it um, but it, let them take a photo of their homework or give them a little note that they can put in their books so that they've got a, a, a prompter for you know in order to help them. So the next part of this that I want to talk about is We've spoken about working memory and we've spoken about deficits in working memory and what we can do. But it's important that we also understand the neuroplasticity of the brain. So in the past, it was always thought that brain development was quite static, that uh, you could develop a child's brain up until the age of six and thereafter, oh, well, we've done what we can now you know there's not much more we can do and that's not true um so the neuroplasticity refers to a brain's ability to adapt we've seen this in in um, people that have have had brain injuries and a part of their brain that's been damaged they've been able to um develop new pathways to do things um in, from a different part of the brain. So um, the brain is a, a wonderful um, muscle. I always tell the children it's a muscle that you have to work. And we can create new connections between the neurons and form new pathways. And children's brains are constantly growing and developing and changing. 
Yes, it would be ideal if we can get the intervention as early as possible. Um, it, working in a remedial environment, oftentimes we get children coming into our school in grade five and grade six. And often we say, if only we had had them earlier on, the chances of getting them back into mainstream are greater because the neuroplasticity, obviously, as you get older, the neuroplasticity is not as um, great as when you are younger. But that doesn't mean that it's stagnant, even as adults, um, we can change the neuroplasticity of the brain by doing um, simple exercises, just or learning new things, um, exposing ourselves to, to a new sort of experiences creates those neural pathways. Um, spending time um, learning a, a new language would develop new pathways. So uh, the neuroplasticity of the brain is really important. And that, because of that neuroplasticity, is where we went and looked at research. And because the amount of children coming into Crossroads School, when we were doing our assessments, more than half of them that were coming in had working memory difficulties. So there was a huge trend in our children having these deficits in working memory that we did research as to what can we do? What would be effective? Yes, we can put the classroom strategies in place, but what is out there that we can use um, to develop this um, neuroplasticity that we can um, help our children in order to get them back into mainstream, in order to develop these skills? and help them achieve because that's ultimately our goal is our motto is let none left uh, let none be left behind and that's our, our our focus is that we don't want children to be left behind we want to to extend them as much as possible so the cognitive working memory program was developed on the idea of the neuroplasticity of the brain so it comes from the idea that an individual's brain can change. And it was started in Sweden quite a, a number of years ago. It's, it's, it's not something new. It's newish to South Africa, but it's not something new to the rest of the world. Initially, when the training was developed, um, it was initially done uh, or used for um, Alzheimer patients in order to help them with their, their working memory. Um, and uh, during their studies, they actually discovered that the children with ADHD significantly improved their working memory with the training. And um, this whole program then was developed to focus on learners with uh, working memory difficulties. I know on the slide it says a total of 1,400 participants, but that is when the initial research was done. There is a lot more um, uh, people that have completed it. Um, it started in Sweden and Switzerland and England. And um, uh, Gerard Finmore, who's a, a, um, a clinical psychologist, he um, helped to translate um, the, the program into English, and he was um, privileged enough to be able to bring it to South Africa. Um, and, um, and there's not a lot of people that know about the program, unless, you know, you are in um, the psycho psychology field. And when we did our research, he was, he came to our school, and he taught us, and he showed us everything, and we just thought this program is what we need for our learners. So let me tell you about the CogMed program. So the program is um, a software-based program. It is for children and for adults. You can use it at home, although obviously we use it at the school. Um, you can go through, as I said, Gerard does it. Um, you can go privately and, and have it done um, privately. Um, and um, you do need a CogMed coach. 
Um, all of the psychologists at Crossroads, we are trained, uh, we have been through the training, so we are CogMed qualified coaches. And um, it's clinically proven to be effective, although I do need to say that only eight out of 10 or 80% of children that complete the program will see improvement. So how does it actually work? So I've said it's software based. So what does it actually entail? So because of the, it works on the neuroplasticity of the brain, the children do a series of exercises. Um, we use an iPad and um, each exercise takes them through a different aspect of either the auditory memory or the visual memory where they have to follow the, the um, exercise and the difficulty level is adjusted. So all the children start at a base level, their base level, and the, the system um, adjusts to the child. So I am gonna show you a video clip so it makes a little bit more sense, but when the children start, they'll start at level two, um, and then it'll push them up to three. And if they can manage three, it will then push them to four. If they get to a four and they start to struggle, it'll take them back down to three. So again, it keeps extending that neuroplasticity, that keeps extending those pathways in order to, to develop that, that um, increased memory. Um, obviously, it, it, you need um, a coach to, to work through it with you. We, we find in, in, in our school in Crossroads, because uh, our children do struggle with inattention, do struggle with learning difficulties, they need a supportive coach. So they, the home program, um, parents would have to take responsibility. Here, uh, um, we sit with our children, we work through it because often they need the motivation. Um, it does help them to resist the distractions because um, that's what they've got to work on. And as I've said, it does, the research is that eight out of 10 children will be um, show improvement. So the original program that we had um, had um, a, um, a little robot. And that was the program we started with in 2018 or 2017 when we did the research. And this year, um, well, towards the end of the year, last year, um, CogMed uh, decided to revamp the program um, to modernize it because obviously our children are very um, technologically advanced compared to what we were growing up or I was growing up. Um, and they have the games like Roblox, they have all these games. So they have already have the stimulation of um, all the things, you know, on iPads. So this new version, they made it a little bit more simplistic, more modern and streamlined. But then they built in a reward base. So um, the reward base is this building. So as you work through, you collect, um, you earn gold and gems. And then when you finish your day's training, then you can build your city. And so they have some creativity in there where they can create and they can make their own city. Um, so the previous version was um, they just got to do a race with the robot. Um, and so this sort of is more in, in line with what our, our children um, enjoy and what they are exposed to in terms of games. Okay. So what I want to do is I'm going to show you, this video is a little bit longer, but I want to, um, it's a demonstration. Um, it, it's um, an, uh, um, an Australian school that's using it. Or um, there's a, well, there's quite a lot of schools, but the, it's um, a, a demo from an Australian um, company explaining it. And, and it'll just give you a better idea of how the program works and how the steps, um, you know, the child works through the program. So I'm going to show you the video clip.
And this is called the Cogmed Islands, and it's asking me to unpack crates to get resources to build with. So each Cogmed game is a crate, and when I complete each Cogmed exercise that's assigned for the day, then I'm going to earn money and gems that I can use to expand my little world that I've got here. So that's pretty awesome. <laughs> Very motivating for me anyway. You can see that in the demo mode, all of the games are shown here. This won't be the case when you do Cogmed for real. You'll have either three or five games to do, depending on the protocol that you choose. So you'll just have some of the games presented here and those will change um, according to Cogmed's protocol each day. So there are a variety of exercises in Cogmed and they are focusing, some of them are focusing on auditory working memory and some of them are focusing on visual working memory. So what I'm going to do today is just show you an example of each. So let's look at a, an auditory working memory game. So that's memory for what you hear. I'm going to choose this one. It's called Digits. Eight. Nine. So it's giving me some instructions. And in this game, I need to put the numbers in backwards. So I heard eight, nine. So I'm going to click nine, eight. And then I can see I've gone up a level and some blue goes into my progress here. Nine. Three. Five. Six. So the first time you do Cogmed, it is going to look like this and you're going to get just two numbers to remember. Then what's going to happen is pretty quickly it's going to move to three numbers. Six. Two. Six. So this was a very easy combination of three numbers. Okay, and the demo stops there. So when you do Cogmed, for real, obviously, it's going to be longer. <laughs> Each exercise is going to be longer than that. But I really like how you can see your progress and you can see what level you're working at. So on the first time you do each game, it's going to figure out what your working memory capacity is. And this is a really important feature of Cogmed because the working memory of a, you know, a, a six-year-old and the working memory of a 56-year-old are going to be very different. So it's going to work out how much you can remember. And then the goal of Cogmed is to push those boundaries. So I have people who are remembering, say, eight or nine numbers backwards now on that particular game, which is amazing. And so Cogmed is each day pushing them a little bit, making it a little bit harder so that they can remember more and more. And that's how we strengthen working memory. There's another version of that exercise where you have to sequence the numbers backwards, but you can't see the numbers while you're hearing them. So you can see that the game that I've just gone is that the game that I've just done ha is not here anymore. So I have one less game. I'm going to do an exercise that looks at my visual working memory now. So I'm going to do the grid game. So again, I need to remember what I saw. So again, two is pretty easy. In my personal version of Cogmed, I can do about eight of these now. I'm sure when you do Cogmed, you're going to get better than me. Okay, so remembering, that's remembering what I see. And great, I earned a new building. Awesome. And there's also a version of that exercise which actually rotates around. These exercises look pretty simple, but that is the point. They're not supposed to be really complicated, but when they work up to your level, they're going to challenge you so much. The one that actually challenges me the most, everyone has a different exercise that's going to challenge them. The one that challenges me most is the cube exercise. I think it's because there are so many squares here and the cube is also moving. So 
some people really like this exercise, but this one really challenges my brain. So by repetitively doing these exercises that work to stretch your working memory, you're going to increase the capacity of your working memory, which means that you can fit more in it, which means that then you're going to be able to you know, remember more in, in all aspects of your life. And who doesn't want to remember more? Okay, so once I've actually finished all of my games for the day, I'm going to be able to go into build mode. In the demo, I can actually switch to build mode now, and I'll show you what it looks like. So this is the world that I've got, and I've got a bunch of money up here that I've earned from doing Cogmere games and a bunch of gems. And what I can actually do is I can build my world. Okay, so you can sort of see how... It, children might be interested in the building part. They don't always enjoy the exercise part because obviously it does extend them. And yes, we start off quite simple, but um, it does become more complicated. So as I've said previously, we see improvements in eight out of 10, um, improved working mem memory in preschool children, adolescents, older, anybody can do this program. And as you heard, obviously, it works according to your, your ability. So it's not going to expect that you all do the same. Um, we've said that it, it helps for ADHD, um, for brain injury. Uh, there's also been research for cancer survivors. Um, there is a thing called uh, chemo brain and that has helped. And, and just thinking of the pandemic that we're going through with COVID, um, a lot of peer, uh, people that have had COVID also have that sort of brain fog. And I think this could also be, uh, you know, helpful for, for people in terms of improving their um, memory after they've had COVID. So I just want to tell you how we have implemented it at Crossroads as a school, how we have managed to incorporate it into our school as part of a um, a program that we offer to, to our parents. So as I said to you previously, we started in 2017 with just a pilot study. So we, we took five students and we, we tested the program and we were quite impressed with it. And so we decided to, to purchase it and the rollout started in 2018. So we've been doing it since 2018. To date, 175 learners have gone through our program. What we look for in a criteria, um, so when we assess working memory, so your average working memory would be between 90 and 109. That's the average. Um, so realistically, it would be children under the, whose score is under 90. But at Crossroads, we um, take children who scores from 95 and under. Um, we take the midline there. And we also look at their processing speed. So although this program is not um, meant to address processing speed, we did find that a lot of children um, who had difficulties in working memory and processing speed, their processing speed improved because of the, the need to, to follow the instructions. Um, we do exclude candidates with epilepsy just because of the, the movement and the um, uh, sort of flashing so, because we don't want to um, uh, sort of set them into a seizure. Um, our learners, we take Monday to Thursday, we have a morning slot. Um, so the minute school starts, um, they have um, a session with the psychologist. Each psychologist takes five children and they attend sessions Monday to Thursday. The reason we don't do, on a, uh, do it on a Friday is because of cycle tests and um, because Cogmed does cause a little bit of fatigue because they are exercising um, and, and working on an area that is um, difficult for them. Our sessions run for eight weeks. So we usually, each term, we take a new group of children. So each term we'll take um, 15 children and put them through the program. Um, as I said, we are all trained Cogmec coaches and then we will give feedback to the parents. So 
when we when they finish the program, they um, the program does tell us in terms of what they they have improved from when they started to to when they finished, what their their marker was from beginning to the end. But what is more important for us as psychologists, what we've been looking at, is when we reassess the children um, and relook at their working memory after they've completed the program. So to date, um, we've reassessed about 36 learners because it depends on when their reassessments are, are um, due. And out of the 36 that have done our program, 29 showed improvement in their working memory from two points up into 35 points, which is really huge. Um, and seven learners showed no improvement. Um, and we will continue to sort of monitor that um, in terms of, of the improvement. Um, just feedback from teachers in terms of scholastically, and this was from the first, the initial group of grade sevens that we started, the teacher was able to see improvement in their marks, jumping from 60% to 87%, 49% to 64 um, so the ability to retain things, um, feedback from parents, you know, like um, one of our parents said, you know, I used to struggle, my, my son used to struggle to remember his Afrikaans spelling. She said, I would start on a Monday and we would practice it every single day. And she said, now I'm only having to do it once. And he remembers it for his spelling test. Um, so what we've experienced with our learners, as I said, they do get fatigued um, because um, it's it's an area that that they have to work on um, when I when I um, bring the learners in and I explain to them the reason they've been chosen because we, we make it as if it's um, you know you've been, you have been chosen you are the chosen ones because everybody you know doesn't want to always do the additional work but you have been chosen this is the reason why we want to improve your memory because your brain is a muscle and just like you would exercise your arms or legs to get stronger we are exercising your brain so uh, teachers do notice that while they're on the program there is this fatigue which is why i've said we, we don't do it on a friday but once they've completed it there's they're more alert. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that you, the true benefits of the program are only seen four weeks after the program's completed. So if we've done it in, let's say the second term, you actually only see the results of the cognitive training in the third term um, because it takes time. Um, often uh, one of the questions, and it might be a question that comes up, we get asked, will we need to redo the program? So if we do it once, do we need to redo it, redo it? The idea is that no, you do it once, you develop that neuroplasticity, and as long as you use that, you won't need to, to redo the program. Um, I've just put in there for, for further information, uh, you can go onto the CogMed um, website. Uh, you purchase the um, CogMed through Pearson's, but the person in South Africa who we deal with is Jared Finmore. Um, we work through him, uh, he gets our license. If there's any technical issues, um, if I'm struggling with anything on the program, um, I just contact him, he contacts um, America and it gets sorted out. So um, he is my the go-to person. Okay, so that brings my presentation um, to a close, but obviously I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and then we can go to um, some questions and hopefully I can answer all the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Georgina. That was a very interesting um, interesting coverage of working memory and, uh, and, and Cognit and I think how Cognit works to, to the benefit of improving it. Um, I think also, you know, the, the emphasis is quite important that, um, that we are, are the one, one of the accredited schools in South Africa for um, to, to manage 
COGMED. Um, and as we've seen the benefit of it um, quite significantly in our children, we are looking at offering it um, independently to, to external children. So, um, so what we'll be doing is putting together um, two or three programs of uh, how best um, parents can implement this at home with their children, uh, whilst then being monitored by uh, school by, by the, the uh, psychologists who've been trained um, and who need that continual feedback to, to make sure that the program is being run effectively. Um, just uh, are there, um, if there are any questions, please, please feel free to put your hand up or to um, put a question in the chat. Um, and we are very happy to open, open the forum. Um, we have got eight minutes left, so I'm cognizant of, of time. Um, I think also what's very important to observe is that our children have much more of an affinity for technology than we do. So let's meet them where they are good. Um, and that's really where CogMed is, is exceptionally beneficial because it's meeting them on, on a platform that they can recognize and that they work with quite easily. And whilst the working memory aspect is quite difficult, so it is actually quite hard for them to do, there is this, this reward benefit that they have um, playing a CogMed program uh, where it's a game, but actually they don't realize that it's benefiting them. <laughs> their working memory while, while they're doing it. So it's really meeting them on their level um, whilst trying to achieve something that they ultimately need, need to achieve to improve their education. Um, and in, I, uh, Georgina, I was actually thinking about questions as you, you were going along, but as soon as I wrote a question down, you answered it in, in the next session. Uh, <laughs> so I actually haven't got any questions for you because the, you, you answered the um, ADHD um, and uh, the, the internal external distraction and, and, and the correlation to ADHD. And I found that, you know, so you, you, you answered that. Um, and I see we do have a question in the chat. Um, Davina asks, will this pro is this program user friendly for learners with visual impairments? Um, it depends on, on uh, how uh, significant the visual impairment is, um, because I know with, uh, we've been able to do the program with children with auditory impairments, so those with cochlear implants and uh, hearing aids have been able to do the program. Um, visual impairments, I could say, um, the, the auditory part will be fine. It might hamper them on following the patterns. But like I said, it depends on the extent of the visual impairment. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, in terms of that. I hope that answers the, the question. Yeah, I think it does. I think that's probably assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and mm -hmm. you'd have to look at it from, from that um, perspective. Vanessa asks, once the student has completed the program, how do we ensure that the child's working memory continues to flourish? Well, the theory behind it is that um, once you have developed those neural pathways and once you start using them, so once you start remembering more, um, that, you know, um, is, is is what you know the child's going to remember. But I think you still need to keep in those strategies of um, that I've said, you know, perhaps asking them to repeat things back or um, keeping them organized so, so that they use, um, you know, that, that skill that they have, have learned. Vanessa, is that enough of an answer for you? That's fine, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, if there are any other questions, please um, please uh, shout. And um, if you would like any further information on CogMed um, or working memory, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we really would like to make ourselves available for um, information, for, uh, for sharing knowledge and empowering you um, so you can empower your children. Um, I think our ultimate goal is, is shared and that is very much to, to ensure that our children um, have, have access and are, are able to access um, education in, in the best way possible. Um, Debbie it asks, is the program suitable for a preschool child with limited computer skills? Um, it's a, the, 
The initial program, um, they used to have a different um, levels in that you could um, initiate a junior primary, you know, or foundation, or sorry, preschool foundation phase and then older. Um, so it is supposed to be from about, I'd say, learners from about five, six. But my experience of our learners is that the younger they are, the more um, support they need. So um, I, we have tended to sort of stick to the um, intermediate phase because our, our junior phase really struggle and they need quite a lot of input. So I, I can't, um, although the program says you can use it, I haven't, we haven't personally in, implemented it in, in, for younger children. Um, but if you think about the fact that it is following and, and it works according to the child's um, uh, abilities, but I probably wouldn't recommend, I would say um, I would start it perhaps rather in a school going child that has some computer skills. I think that would probably be a better um, you know, idea. Yeah, I think so too. Um, another question is asked by, by um, two, two other attendees um, in terms of the cost of the program. And, and I, think, um, I think we need to, uh, to be very careful because we, we we can't quote what um, private people charge, um, what what private practitioners charge, um, and the 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 price is roughly roughly seven and a half eight thousand rand. Um, it depends on the practitioner. Um, at at Crossroads, we will be looking at how to fund this um, uh, and 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 cost it effectively for for more children to benefit from it. So. Um, I think if those if those numbers are um, quite large for you and for your parents, um, please let us know if you are interested in um, in uh, sending some children to Cognitive Crossroads, um, and and we will then have an idea of the of the level of interest um, and where where we need to benchmark the the financing of it um, and the cost. So, yeah, I think Georgina, do you have anything to add from that perspective? I just wanted to say. Um... I don't know if they also inquiring because obviously we pay a license fee every year. So I don't know if they, um, in terms of if that was a question on behalf of a school wanting to purchase it for a school, um, because uh, we obviously purchase a, a license fee every year in order to to um, have the program. So I'm not sure if if. Because I, I can tell you what the license fee is um, um, in terms of um, yeah. So I, th I think answer that answer that question too. Yeah. So so as as a school cost, what are, what is the license fee? Yeah. So so the license fee that we pay um, annually depends on obviously the exchange rate, but it's roughly twenty two twenty three thousand a year, and that entitles us to to. Um, have an uh, unlimited amount of children that we can put through the program. Um, obviously, if you purchase it as a school, there's an additional cost to train um, the staff or whoever is going to run the program. That would be an additional cost. Um, one more question. Uh, we are at the end of our time. So this is the last question from Jane. And will a child that has ADHD benefit from this or would it take extra time um, taking extra work to accomplish what the other learners will accomplish in this program? Well, coming from a remedial school where majority of our children do have ADHD, I would say yes, because our children, um, you know, majority of them have either ADHD or um, are spectrum or, you know, so they hear because of, of a learning difficulty. So they definitely do benefit from it. Um, the only thing, as I've said, is our children require more input, which is why we can't do it as a home program for them. Um, they need us to be there because the distractibility will still come. They will still be they'll want to chat to you or they'll want to talk to their friend. So um, definitely benefits them, but they do need that, that more support, which is why we do it in-house at, at Crossroads to support the learners through the program. Great. 
Great, thanks very much, Georgina. That's helpful. I think also just a point on um, the cost for, for the school because it is quite expensive. Um, I think that's that's why we've um, we've decided as a as a licensed cognitive school um, to offer this to uh, to external children because it then becomes much more affordable um, and and also for for schools who who can then outsource that um, that cost to um, to uh, another party um, as opposed to charging um, or in, in including it in your offering. So um, yeah, so that is an an alternative option. Um, Georgina, thank you very much for your time tonight and, and for sharing all this information with us. I think it has been very, very beneficial. Um, everyone will receive the link to this, to this recording uh, in the next couple of days once it's been um, finalized. And, um, and we, will, we will send that through to you, please. Also join our next webinar. Um, we really are about sharing information and creating the awareness um, of these, these various um, challenges that, that children have. Um, so we can help them uh, them learn learn the skills to learn better. So uh, the next session is on occupational therapy in the classroom. Um, I will send out a um, a, a flyer um, for everyone to uh, to register and to see that um, to to get that link. So I will send that through to you um, by the end of the week, which is tomorrow. So thank you very much for joining us. And um, six thirty two. That's not bad timing. Uh, we will see you all again soon. Good night. Bye. <laughs>